The fluorescent lights hummed softly overhead as my fingers moved across the keyboard and lines of code scrolled by on my monitor. But my mind was not fully focused on the task at hand. A nagging feeling had been bothering me all day, and I couldn't shake it off. I glanced at the clock on my desk. 9.37 p.m., it's Friday night. I should have been home hours ago, but the project deadline was approaching and I needed to complete it. Still, something seemed off. I reached for my phone, paused briefly before dialing our home number. The phone rang once, twice, and three times right as I was about to hang up. Emily might be sleeping. Someone responded. Hello? The voice was not Emily's. It was deep, slurred, and clearly male. My heart rate immediately doubled. Who is this? I demanded, gripping the phone firmly. A low chuckle came from the speaker. Your wife is entertaining me. Hang up. The line went dead for a moment. I sat there frozen in disbelief. Then, like a dam bursting, a flood of emotions rushed through me. Anger, fear, confusion, and betrayal all battled for dominance. I jumped up and nearly knocked over my chair. Grabbing my coat, I dashed out of the office, barely remembering to lock the door behind me. The drive home was a blur. My mind raced, replaying recent events and looking for clues I may have overlooked. Emily had been distant lately, frequently arriving home late from work. There were unexplained charges on her credit card. We've been arguing more frequently about trivial matters. How could I have been so blind? I muttered, slamming my hand against the steering wheel as I drove into our driveway. I noticed an unfamiliar car parked in the street. My stomach churned. Part of me wanted to turn back and drive away, to pretend that this was not happening. But I could not. I needed to know the truth. I got out of the car. My legs felt like lead as I walked to the front door. My hand shook as I put the key into the lock. I took a deep breath, turned the key, and pushed open the door. The house was too quiet. I could hear my own heartbeat pounding in my ears as I walked upstairs. As I approached our bedroom, I noticed muffled voices and movement without hesitation. I threw open the door. The sight that greeted me would be forever etched in my memory. Emily, my wife of five years, was sharing our bed with another man. Not just any man, but her boss, Brad Hastings, for a moment. Time appeared to stand still. Emily's eyes widened with shock and horror. Brad seemed more annoyed than anything else. Ryan. Emily gasped and clutched the sheets to her chest. I, I could explain. I could not speak. My throat felt as though it was closing up. Instead, I pulled out my phone and began recording. What the hell are you doing? Brad growled, scrambling for his clothes. Get out! I finally spoke, my voice low and dangerous. Both of you, get out of my house! Emily started crying. Ryan, let me explain. It's not as you think. I laughed bitterly. Not what I think. I arrive home to find my wife in bed with another man. And it is not what I think. Save your excuses, Emily. Simply get out. Brad, now partially dressed, attempted to approach me. Look, Mitchell... Let's talk about this as adults. I took a step back and kept my phone trained on them. There is nothing to talk about. Get out before I call the police. Emily stumbled out of bed, tears running down her cheeks. Ryan, please. I love you. We can work it out. Her words only made me angrier. Love me. Is this how you express love, Emily? By sleeping with your boss in our bed? Get out. As they hurriedly dressed and collected their belongings, I continued recording. Part of me knew I was acting out of pure emotion, but I couldn't control myself. I wanted them to experience the humiliation I was feeling. After they were dressed, I followed them downstairs, still recording. Emily made one last attempt to communicate with me. Ryan, I am deeply sorry. Please, could we just talk about it? I shook my head, my voice trembling with barely controlled rage. How could you do this to us? How about our marriage? Just go. Emily. I cannot even look at you right now. As soon as they left, I slammed the door shut and locked it. Then, without really considering the consequences, I shared the video on social media. I sank into the couch, head in my hands. The reality of what had just occurred began to set in. My marriage, my life as I knew it had ended, and I had no idea what to do next. My phone began buzzing incessantly. Messages from friends and family who had watched the video poured in. Some people expressed shock and sympathy. Others are angry on my behalf. However, I couldn't bring myself to respond to any of them. 
As the night progressed, I sat in the dark, replaying every moment of my relationship with Emily, trying to figure out where it went wrong. How had we gone from a happy marriage to this? The betrayal cut deep, leaving a wound that I didn't think would ever heal. The next morning I awoke on the sofa. My neck stiffened and my head pounded for a blissful moment. I assumed it had all been a terrible nightmare. Then reality struck back and the pain hit me all over again. I checked my phone. The video went viral overnight. There were numerous comments, messages, and missed calls. I scrolled through them indifferently, not taking anything in. A loud bang on the door startled me. I stood up slowly, my body protesting every move. When I opened the door, Emily was standing there. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying. Ryan, she replied, her voice hoarse, we need to talk. I leaned against the doorframe, suddenly exhausted. I believe you said enough last night, Emily. She flinched at my words but continued on. Please let me explain. I never intended for this to happen. Against my better judgment. I moved aside to let her in as she walked past me. I got a whiff of her perfume. I used to find this scent intoxicating. Now it just makes me feel sick. We sat at opposite ends of the couch. The distance between us felt like an unbridgeable chasm. Emily took a deep breath. Ryan, I am deeply sorry. What I did was unacceptable. I am aware of this, but you need to believe me. I never intended to hurt you. I laughed bitterly. Nobody wanted to hurt me. How did you think sleeping with your boss would make me feel? She flinched again. It was not like that, Brad. He promised me a promotion. They said it would help our future, I thought. I assumed I was doing this for us. My anger, which had been simmering beneath the surface, erupted for us. Are you kidding, Emily? How the hell was she sleeping with him? Was this supposed to help us? I know it sounds crazy, she admitted, tears welling up in her eyes. But things have been so tight lately with the mortgage and student loans. I figured if I could get this promotion, we'd finally be able to start saving for a family. I stood up and paced the room. So instead of discussing our financial concerns, you chose to compromise yourself for your boss. Is this what our marriage means to you? Emily gasped, pain flashing across her face. That is not fair, Ryan. I made a horrible mistake. I am aware of this, but I do love you. We can work through it. I stopped pacing and looked at her. Really looked at her. I no longer recognized the woman sitting on my couch. No, Emily, we cannot. You betrayed me in the worst way. There's no going back from that. Ryan, please. She begged and reached out to me. Don't waste five years of marriage on one mistake. I took a step back, avoiding her touch. One mistake. This was not a drunken one-night stand. Emily, you've been lying to me for weeks, possibly months. How long has it been going on? She looked away, unable to meet my gaze. She whispered, a few months. The admission felt like a physical blow. Months, I said, my voice hollow, and you never considered coming clean about how this would destroy me. I wanted to tell you, she explained, but I was afraid. I am afraid of losing you, afraid of destroying everything we'd built together. I shook my head, feeling a strange calm come over me. So, congratulations, Emily. You have done precisely what you were afraid of. It is over. Her eyes widened with panic. No, Ryan, please, we can seek counseling, work through it. I'm going to quit my job, cut all ties with Brad, please. Please give me another chance. Another chance for what? Lie to me, cheat on me. No, Emily, I am done, I want a divorce. The word lingered in the air between us, heavy and final. Emily broke down and sobbed uncontrollably. Ryan, I am begging you, do not do this. I love you, I will do anything to make things right. For a brief moment, I felt my resolve waver. A part of me wanted to comfort her, to hold her and pretend we could return to the way things were. But I knew we could not. The trust was gone, shattered beyond repair. I believe you should leave. I spoke, my voice surprising. Steady. I will have my lawyer contact you regarding the divorce proceedings. She stood up, her legs trembling. This cannot be how it ends, Ryan. Please think about it. Take some time. I went to the door and opened it. Goodbye, Emily. As she walked past me, she paused. I truly apologize, Ryan. I hope one day you will forgive me. I did not respond. I simply closed the door behind her and leaned against it as her footsteps faded away. The house felt more empty than ever. I looked around at the life we'd created together. 
the photos on the walls, the little knickknacks we had accumulated over time. Everything seemed to belong to someone else now. My phone vibrated again. It was a message from Brad. Delete that video right away or you'll be sorry later. I stared at the message. I feel a new wave of rage wash over me. Who the hell did he think he was to threaten me? I typed a reply. Go to hell, Brad. You reap what you sow. I hit the send button and then blocked his number. I knew it was not over, that there would be consequences to my actions. But at the time, I didn't care. Allow him to make every effort. I had nothing more to lose. The following week passed in a blur. I filed for divorce, hoping to avoid dealing with the emotional fallout. My lawyer, a no-nonsense woman named Sarah, warned me that things could get messy. Are you certain you want to go through with this? She asked during our first meeting. Infidelity can sometimes be resolved between couples. I shook my head firmly. No, there is no going back. I want to get this over with as soon as possible. Sarah nodded and made a note in her file. All right, but you should know about the video you posted. It could complicate matters. Mr. Hastings might use it against you. I leaned back in my chair, feeling a headache developing. Allow him to try. I am not taking it down. As I exited Sarah's office, my phone rang with a message from my boss, Dave Coleman. I need to see you in my office right away. A feeling of dread settled in my stomach. I'd been so preoccupied with my personal life falling apart that I hadn't given much thought to how this might affect my work. I went straight to the office, trying to prepare for whatever was coming. Dave was waiting for me when I arrived. His face was grim. He motioned for me to take a seat. Ryan, he began cautiously. Neutral. I'm sure you understand why I called you in. I nodded, not trusting my ability to speak. Dave sighed and ran his hand through his thinning hair. Look, I'm not here to judge your personal life, but I did see the video you posted. It is causing issues for the company. Problems? I echoed. I'm experiencing a surge of anger. I was betrayed, and now I'm causing problems. I understand you're upset, Dave said, raising a hand. However, we have a reputation to maintain. Clients are asking questions. It isn't good for business. I leaned forward, gripping the chair's arms. So, David, what are you saying? He refused to meet my gaze. I apologize, Ryan, but we'll have to let you go for a moment. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Are you firing me because my wife cheated on me? Dave slid a document across his desk. Your contract allows for a termination without cause. I'll offer a severance package. Of course. I stared at the paper, feeling like I was in a twisted nightmare. This is nonsense, Dave. I've dedicated five years to this company. My work has always been exceptional. I know Ryan, and I sincerely apologize. But the decision has been made. You can clean up your desk now or return after hours, whichever you prefer. I got up abruptly, my chair scraping against the floor. I will do it now. I didn't want to cause any further problems for the company as I packed up my belongings. My co-workers avoided eye contact and whispered amongst themselves. I felt like a pariah, branded by my own pain and anger as I prepared to leave. Brad Hastings appeared at the doorway of my former office. He leaned against the frame with a smug expression on his face. I warned you you'd regret it, he said, his voice so low that only I could hear something inside me snap before I realized what I was doing. My fist hit his face. Brad stumbled backwards. Blood was spurting from his nose. You son of a bitch! I yelled and lunged for him again, but security had already arrived, grabbing my arms and pulling me back. Brad wiped the blood from his face, and his smug smile turned into a furious snarl. You're done, Mitchell, he spit. I will ensure that you never work in this industry again. As security led me out of the building, I could feel everyone's eyes on me. My co-workers, people I had considered, and friends watched in stunned silence as I was led to the exit. Once outside, one of the security guards, Mike, whom I had always been friendly with, gave me a sympathetic look. I am sorry, man. For what it's worth, I believe you received a raw deal. I nodded, unable to respond. I watched as they carried my belongings to the car. As I drove away from the office for the final time, I felt as if I was witnessing someone else's life unravel. In a matter of days, I felt the full weight of what had happened over the previous week. I'd lost my wife, my job, and my dignity. I pulled over on the side of the road, unable to see through the tears that had finally flowed. 
I let out a primal scream of rage and pain, pounding my fists on the steering wheel until they ached. When I ran out of tears, I sat there, staring blankly at the road ahead. I had no idea what to do next, or how I was going to pick up the pieces of my shattered life. But one thing was obvious. This was not over. Brad Hastings and Emily had stolen everything from me, and I was going to make them pay for it. The days after my firing blurred together. I spent the majority of my time holed up in my apartment, blinds drawn, ignoring calls from concerned friends and family. The humiliation of losing everything burned like acid in my stomach. One morning, while scrolling mindlessly through social media, I came across a post that piqued my interest. It was a photograph of Brad Hastings at a charitable event. His arm wrapped around a petite, blonde woman. The caption identified her as Jessica Hastings, his wife. I looked at the image, studying Jessica's expression. Her smile appeared forced, her eyes tired and sad. Something about her expression struck a chord with me, and before I could talk myself out of it, I messaged her. Hello, Jessica. You don't know who I am, but my name is Ryan Mitchell. I think we should talk about your husband. To my surprise, she replied almost immediately. Ryan, I know who you are. I've watched the video. What do you want? I took a deep breath and typed, to tell you the truth and hopefully get some answers. Can we meet? There was a long pause before her reply arrived. Okay, tomorrow at 2 p.m. at Café Noir, 5th Street. I can't stay for long. The following day, I arrived at the café early, my stomach in knots. I hadn't showered or shaved in days, and I was sure I looked just as bad as I felt, but I didn't mind. This was not about me. Jessica walked in at precisely 2 p.m. She was even more stunning in person, especially up close. I could see the shadows under her eyes, which were carefully concealed with makeup. She slid into the seat across from mine. Her movements are tense. You have 15 minutes, Mr. Mitchell. Make them count. I nodded, gathering my thoughts. First, I'd like to apologize. I understand that my actions have probably made things difficult for you. Jessica's laughter was bitter. Difficult. That is one word for it. Do you know what it's like to have your husband's affair exposed all over the internet? I grimaced. I apologize. I was not thinking clearly. I just... I wanted to hurt them the way they hurt me. Her expression softened slightly. I understand how you feel. But why did you want to meet me? I leaned forward and lowered my voice. Because I believe there is more going on here than just an affair. Brad, he is not a good man, is he? Jessica's eyes widened before darting around the cafe. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Jessica. I spoke gently. I've seen how you look in photos with him, like you're just checking to see if anyone is listening. You're afraid of him, right? Tears welled in her eyes. You do not understand. I cannot. I cannot discuss this. I reached out, stopped just short of touching her hand. You can. I want to help you. She shook her head furiously. You can't help me. Nobody can. If I leave him, he will take everything I have, including my home, money, and children. Isn't he abusive? I asked. I already knew the answer. Jessica's silence spoke volumes. Listen to me. I said, my voice firm but friendly. You do not have to live like this. There are people who can help. I know a lawyer. A lawyer? Jessica interrupted, her voice rising. Do you think I hadn't thought of it? Brad owns half of the lawyers in the city. The other half is for two. I'm too afraid to confront him. I nodded, understanding her fear. I know someone who is not from around here. Someone who is not fearful of Brad. We can accomplish this together, Jessica. We can bring him down. She looked at me with hope and fear in her eyes. Why would you help me? You don't even know me. Because it's the correct thing to do, I replied simply. And Brad has to pay for what he has done to both of us. Jessica was silent for a long time. She then took a deep breath. Okay, tell me about this attorney. I smiled for the first time in what seemed like ages. His name is Ethan Roberts. He is an old college friend. If anyone can assist us, it's him. And you believe him? Jessica inquired, still hesitant. With my life, I assured her. He is the best there is. Jessica nodded slowly. All right, I will meet with him. But Ryan, make me a promise, anything I've said. Promise me that no matter what happens, you will help me protect my children. They are all I have left. I met her gaze, recognizing the fierce love of a mother in her eyes. I promise, Jessica. We're in it together now. We will make sure you and your children are safe. Jessica left the cafe. 
I felt a spark of hope ignite in my chest for the first time since that fateful night. I had a purpose, a reason to continue fighting. I took out my phone and dialed a number that I hadn't called in years. It was time to catch up with an old friend. The phone rang repeatedly before a familiar voice answered. Ethan Roberts is speaking. I paused for a moment, feeling unsure of myself. Ethan? It's Ryan. Ryan. Mitchell. There was a prolonged pause on the other end. Ryan. Well, this is unexpected. It has been, what, ten years? Yeah, about that, I explained, running my hand through my hair. Listen, I know we didn't part on good terms, but I need your assistance. Ethan's voice became cold. Can I help? That is an impressive sum. Last I checked, you made it clear that you did not want anything to do with me. I exhaled. I understand and I apologize. I was young and stupid. But it's not about me, Ethan. There are people who need your assistance. Innocent people. So why should I care? Ethan inquired. But I could detect a hint of curiosity in his voice. Because you're still the same guy who aspired to change the world. Aren't you the guy who went to law school to fight for the underdog? There was another pause. Then Ethan exhaled. All right, I am listening. But this must be good, Mitchell. I took a deep breath and laid everything out. The affair, the video, I lost my job. Then I told him about Jessica and Brad, their abuse and fear. When I finished, Ethan was silent for a long time. Jesus, Ryan, you really stepped in at this point, didn't you? Yes, I suppose I did, I admitted. So will you help me meet at my office tomorrow at 9 a.m.? Ethan described it as sharp. Also, Ryan, don't be late. The next morning, I found myself standing outside a modern office building in downtown Austin. Ethan's name appeared on the directory and his firm occupied the entire top floor. My stomach was churning with nerves as I rode up the elevator. The last time I saw Ethan, we had almost fought over a girl, Emily. The irony was not lost on me. Ethan's receptionist, a stern-looking woman in her 50s, looked at me suspiciously. Mr. Roberts is expecting you. Go right in. I pushed open the heavy oak door and entered Ethan's office. He was standing near the window. His back to me had been filled out since college. In a tailored suit, his lean frame appears solid and imposing. You're on time, Ethan said, turning to face me. That is new. I managed a weak smile. People change. His eyes narrowed at the old nickname. Do they? Because from where I stand, you appear to be the same reckless hothead who stole my girlfriend and ruined our friendship. I flinched at his words. That is not fair, Ethan. Emily and I. It was not like that. Ethan laughed bitterly. Oh, seriously. So, Ryan, how was it? Enlighten me. We fell in love, I replied quietly. It was not planned. It's just happened. I never intended to hurt you. But you did, Ethan snapped. And now you're asking for my help, because the same woman cheated on you. Isn't karma a bitch? His words sting, but I couldn't argue. He was correct. I deserve that, and probably much more, but Ethan, this is not about me or Emily. It's about Jessica Hastings and her children. They need your help. Ethan's expression softened slightly. Tell me everything. I mean everything, Ryan. There's no bullshit. For the next hour, I recounted the entire sordid story. Ethan listened intently, occasionally requesting clarification or more information. When I finished, he leaned back in his chair, his fingers stippling beneath his chin. Mitchell, you've gotten yourself into a really bad situation. I nodded, feeling the weight of everything bear down on me. I understand, but I can't walk away. Not when I know what Brad is doing to Jessica and the children. Ethan remained quiet for a long time, studying me. Then he exhaled. All right, I'll help. But not for you, Ryan, for Jessica and her kids. Relief washed over me. Thank you, Ethan. You're not sure what this means? He raised a hand. Do not thank me yet. This won't be easy. Brad Hastings has money and connections. We'll need more than just your word and Jessica's testimonial. I nodded. What are your suggestions? Ethan tapped his fingers on the desk, thinking we needed hard evidence, financial records, witness statements, or anything indicating a pattern of abuse and misconduct. And we need someone who can dig up dirt without being caught, such as a private investigator. I asked, and Ethan nodded. Exactly. I know someone who could help. Her name is Mia Lewis, ex-cop turned private investigator. She's the best in the industry. Can we trust her? I asked. Ethan. Smile was dissatisfied with our lives. Mia is as straight as they come, 
and she has a special hatred for men who abuse their power. I felt a glimmer of hope. Okay, let us do it. As I stood to leave, Ethan called out Ryan. I turned back. Yeah. His expression was unreadable. For whatever it's worth. I am sorry about Emily. Nobody deserves that kind of betrayal. I swallowed hard, fighting back the emotions that his words evoked. Thank you, Seth, and I really apologize for everything. He nodded with a ghost of a smile on his face. I know, let's go make that bastard pay. I left Ethan's office feeling lighter than I had in weeks. We had a plan. We had hope. And just maybe. I had my old friend back. The following few weeks were a blur of activity. Ethan introduced me to Mia Lewis, a no-nonsense woman in her 40s with sharp eyes and even sharper wit. So you're the one who caused trouble, she mentioned when we first met, sizing me up. I hope you are ready for what comes next. I nodded, attempting to convey more confidence than I felt. Whatever it takes to get Brad down. Mia's smile was predatory. That's what I prefer to hear. Now let us get to work. We created a makeshift command center in a rented office space. Ethan handled the legal strategy while Mia and I focused on gathering evidence. One afternoon, I was poring over financial records that Mia had somehow obtained. She burst into the room. Her eyes gleamed with excitement. I have something, she announced. Two of Brad's former employees are willing to talk. They have stories that will cause your hair to curl. I leaped to my feet. That's great. When can we meet them? Mia raised a hand. Not so fast, hotshot. These individuals are scared. They are taking a significant risk by coming forward. This needs to be handled carefully. Ethan, who had been on the phone in the corner, hung up and joined us. Mia is right. We need to ensure that these witnesses are protected. If Brad finds out, he could ruin their lives. I nodded, chastised. You're correct. So what's the plan? Ethan thought for a moment. We will schedule a meeting somewhere neutral. I'll have a court reporter there to record official statements. Mia, could you please arrange security? She nodded, already working on it. I have a couple of former military buddies who owe me a favor. As they worked out the details, I experienced a mix of excitement and trepidation. We were making progress, but each step felt like we were poking a sleeping bear. The day of the meeting came. We met in a small conference room at a rundown office building on the outskirts of town. Mia's security team scoured the premises for bugs before giving us the all clear. The first witness, a woman named Sarah, appeared nervous but determined. I worked as Brad's assistant for three years. She began with a shaky voice. It was only minor things, inappropriate comments standing too close. However, as Sarah recounted her experiences, the situation escalated. I felt sick to my stomach. She described Brad as a monster. The second witness, a man named Tom, told a different but equally damning story about how he used his power and position to terrorize his employees. Brad asked me to doctor financial reports, he said. His face was pale. He was embezzling money from the company and transferring it to offshore accounts. Ethan leaned forwards, his gaze intense. Do you have proof of this? Tom nodded, taking out a USB drive. Everything is going on here. I kept copies as proof that the court reporter dutifully recorded their statements. I experienced a surge of hope. This was it. We had the evidence we needed to bring Brad down. But my joy was short-lived. As we were finishing up the meeting, Mia's phone vibrated. Her face became pale as she read the message. We have a problem, she explained. Her voice became strained. One of my contacts just saw Brad enter the building. Panic spread throughout the room. Ethan sprung into action. Mia, get Sarah and Tom out of the back way. Ryan joins me. We will create a distraction. Mia hustled our witnesses out. Ethan and I headed for the lobby. Brad's voice was loud and angry, and he demanded to know where we were. Ethan squeezed my shoulder. Prepared for this? I took a deep breath, as prepared as I'd ever be. We entered the lobby right as Brad was about to push past the security guard. His face contorted with rage as he saw us. You? He snarled and lunged towards me. Do you believe you can destroy my life without consequences? Ethan stepped between us. His voice was calm yet firm. Mr. Hastings, I suggest you leave right now unless you want to add assault to your list of charges. Brad's eyes widened. Charges? What the hell are you talking about? I couldn't help smirking. It is over. Brad, we know everything. The abuse and embezzlement. It's all coming out for a moment. 
I was worried Brad was going to attack us, but something in his eyes changed. Anger gave way to fear. This is not over. He hissed and backed away. You have no idea who you are dealing with. Brad stormed out, and I let out a breath. I didn't realize I'd been holding. Ethan clapped my back. Nice co-worker, but the real fight is just starting. We returned to our office and regrouped. Sarah and Tom were safely away. Their statement is secure. We had financial records, witness testimony, and an increasing amount of evidence against Brad. As we sat around the table, exhausted but exhilarated, I looked at my unlikely teammates. Mia's old friend Ethan has become her ally. The tough-as-nails detective. Jessica and her children are counting on us to deliver justice. So what happens next? I asked. Ethan's smile was grim but determined now. Now we are preparing for war. The day of the trial arrived, bringing with it a mix of excitement and fear. As I adjusted my tie in the courthouse bathroom mirror, Ethan appeared behind me. Are you ready for this? He inquired, his gaze meeting mine in the reflection. I took a deep breath. As prepared as I will ever be, do you think we have a shot? Ethan's expression was grim but determined. We have a solid case, but Brad's team is formidable. This is going to be a fight. We made our way into the courtroom where Jessica was already waiting, her hands twisted nervously in her lap. I sat down next to her and gave her a reassuring knot. You've got it, I whispered. Please tell the truth. The bailiff's voice rang out. All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Michaels presides. As we stood, I saw Brad and his legal team. Brad's face was a mask of calm confidence, but I could see tension in his jaw. The judge, a stern-faced woman in her sixties, surveyed the courtroom. You may take a seat, Mr. Roberts. You may start your opening statement. Ethan stood, buttoning his jacket. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're here today to expose a pattern of personal and professional abuse committed by Brad Hastings. As Ethan presented our case, I observed the jurors' reactions. Some people looked shocked, others are skeptical. Brad's attorney, Gerald Thompson, a shark-like man, scribbled notes furiously. When it was Thompson's turn, he painted a drastically different picture. The defense will demonstrate that these allegations are nothing more than a vindictive attempt at character assassination orchestrated by a disgruntled ex-employee and a wife seeking a large payout in divorce court. Battle lines were drawn as the trial progressed. Witnesses were called. I was among the first to take the stand. Thompson's cross-examination was brutal. Mr. Mitchell, isn't it true that you assaulted Mr. Hastings outside your former workplace? I gritted my teeth. Yes, but a simple yes or no is sufficient. Thompson interrupted. Isn't it also true that you posted a video online of Mr. Hastings in a compromising position without his permission? Yes, but the video showed. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. No more questions, as I stepped down, feeling defeated. Ethan caught my gaze and gave me a subtle nod. He had a plan. Jessica was next up. She took a shaky breath while being sworn in. Mrs. Hastings, Ethan started gently. Can you tell the court about your relationship with your husband? Jessica's voice was quiet yet steady. At first, everything went well. Brad could be charming when he wanted to. However, over time, things changed. How is this so? He became controlling, angry. If dinner wasn't ready on time, or if I spoke to another man, even politely, he'd become enraged. Has he ever hit you? Jessica's eyes filled with tears. Yes. The first time occurred about a year into our marriage. He apologized afterwards and promised it would never happen again. But it did. Again and again. Thompson objected, arguing that Jessica's testimony was prejudicial, but the judge overruled him. Jessica recounted years of abuse. I noticed several jurors wiping away tears. Even the judge's stern expression softened. It was Thompson's turn to cross-examine. He went for the throat. Mrs. Hastings, if your husband was so abusive, why did you not leave? Jessica's voice quivered. I was afraid. Brad always threatened to take the kids if I left, claiming that he had ruined me. I believed him. So you stayed because of the money? Thompson pressed. Objection! Ethan yelled, harassing the witness. Sustained, the judge spoke sharply. Mr. Thompson, exercise caution. The following few days were a blur of testimony. Mia took the stand and presented the financial evidence she had uncovered. 
Brad's former employees told their stories of harassment and unethical business practices. It was finally Brad's turn to testify. He cut an imposing figure on the stand, his expensive suit and confident demeanor standing in stark contrast to Jessica's quiet dignity. Mr. Hastings, Thompson began, how will you respond to these allegations? Brad's voice sounded as smooth as oil. Their statements are completely false. I've always treated my wife and employees with respect. This is nothing but a plot to ruin me. LED by a man who couldn't accept that his wife preferred me. I felt my face flush with rage, but Ethan's hand on my arm kept me in my seat. Ethan was relentless during his cross-examination. Mr. Hastings, could you please explain the bank transfers to offshore accounts? Brad's cool facade cracked slightly. These were legitimate business transactions. Really? Because our financial expert appears to believe they are textbook examples of embezzlement. As Ethan systematically dismantled Brad's defenses, I noticed the jury leaning forward, hanging on every word. Brad's responses became increasingly confused and contradictory. Finally, Ethan tried his case. Your Honor, I would like to present Exhibit C, a video recording, as evidence. Brad's face became pale. Objection! This is the illegal video that Mr. Mitchell took. The judge looked over her glasses. Is that true, Mr. Roberts? Ethan smiled. No, Your Honor. This is security camera footage from Mr. Hastings' office, showing him physically assaulting a female employee. We obtained it through legal means during discovery. Brad's expression crumbled as the damning footage played. He realized it was over. Ethan delivered an eloquent and passionate closing argument. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard overwhelming evidence of Mr. Hastings' pattern of abuse, both personally and professionally. It's time to make him accountable. Thompson's closing seemed weak in comparison, full of deception and attempts to discredit witnesses. As the jury began to deliberate, Ethan turned to face me and Jessica. Now we're waiting. The jury deliberated for less than two hours. As we returned to the courtroom, my heart was pounding so hard that I could barely hear the judge ask for the verdict. The foreman faced the charge of domestic abuse. We find Brad Hastings guilty of embezzlement. We found the defendant guilty. A collective gasp echoed through the courtroom. Jessica burst into tears beside me and I could feel my own eyes well up. The judge's voice cut through the confusion. Mr. Hastings, please rise for sentencing. Brad stood there, his face ashen. Bradley Hastings, this court has sentenced you to five years in prison for embezzlement. In addition, you will pay your company $2.5 million in restitution. Domestic abuse charges will result in a three-year concurrent sentence. Upon your release, you will be subject to a permanent restraining order prohibiting you from contacting Jessica Hastings or your children. She turned to face Jessica. Mrs. Hastings, in relation to your divorce, this court grants you full custody of your children. Mr. Hastings will pay substantial alimony and child support, totaling 60% of his assets and future income. The judge's gavel fell. The courtroom erupted into chaos. Reporters demanded statements. Brad's family protested loudly and in the thick of it all. Jessica flung her arms around me. Thank you, she sobbed. Thank you for believing me. I hugged her back. I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. You did it, Jessica. You were brave enough to confront him. As the bailiffs escorted Brad away, I caught his eye. His defeatist expression was almost pitiful. I approached him, ignoring the lawyer's protests. You did it to yourself, Brad, I replied quietly. I simply exposed the truth. He glared at me but did not say anything as he was let out. Ethan clapped my back. We did it, partner. Justice was served, but the victory was bittersweet. As we exited the courthouse, I saw Emily standing by the stairs. She appeared small and lost, a far cry from the confident woman I married, Ryan. She called out hesitantly, Can we speak? I sighed and motioned to Ethan and Jessica to continue on without me. What is it, Emily? She wrung her hands nervously. I, I wanted to apologize for everything. What I did was unforgivable. You're correct. I said with a flat voice. Yes, it was. Tears streamed down her face. I understand, but I want you to know that I never stopped loving you. What I did to Brad was a mistake, the biggest mistake of my life. I felt a twinge of sympathy, but it was overshadowed by memories of her betrayal. I'm sorry, Emily, but this doesn't change anything. Our divorce is finalized. It is over. She nodded and wiped her eyes. I understand. 
I just, I hope one day you will forgive me. I watched her walk away. I felt as if a chapter of my life was coming to an end. It hurt, but it was also liberating. The next few weeks were hectic. My divorce from Emily was finalized, according to the judge's words. She received half of everything. The media coverage of Brad's trial had made finding work in Austin almost impossible. Every potential employer recognized me as the guy from the viral video. One night, as I sat in my half-empty apartment surrounded by moving boxes, Ethan came by with a six-pack of beer. So what is next for you? He asked, passing me a bottle. I shrugged. I honestly have no idea. There is nothing left for me here. Ethan took a long swig from his beer. You know, I have a buddy in Denver who runs a tech startup. They are always looking for good engineers. I raised an eyebrow. Denver, why not? A fresh start. A new city might be exactly what you need. For the first time in months, I had a glimmer of hope as I reflected on it. You know what? Maybe you are right. Ethan grinned. Of course I am right. I'm always correct. It's why I'm such an effective lawyer. I laughed and threw a crumpled napkin at him. And so humble, too. As we clinked our bottles together, I realized that despite everything I had gained something valuable through this ordeal, a renewed friendship. The Rocky Mountains loomed large on the horizon. As I drove into Denver, my car packed with the remnants of my life in Austin. The air felt different here, cleaner somehow. Or maybe that was just my imagination, fueled by the promise of a new beginning. My first stop was the office of Mile High Tech, the startup Ethan's friend ran. The receptionist, a cheerful woman named Linda, greeted me warmly. You must be Ryan. Tom's expecting you. Go right in. Tom Reeves, the CEO, was a laid-back guy in his 40s, with a quick smile and a firm handshake. Ryan, great to meet you in person. Ethan's told me a lot about you. I felt a flicker of anxiety. All good things, I hope. Tom laughed. Well, he mentioned you've had a rough go of it lately, but he also said you're one hell of an engineer. That's what I care about. As Tom showed me around the office, introducing me to the team, I felt something I hadn't experienced in a long time. Excitement. These people were passionate about their work and their energy was contagious. So Tom said as we returned to his office, what do you think? Want to join our merry band of misfits? I grinned. When can I start? The next few months flew by. I threw myself into my work, grateful for the chance to focus on coding rather than courtrooms. My co-workers were friendly and welcoming, never prying into my past. One Friday evening, as we were all heading out for the traditional end-of-week drinks, my team leader Sarah hung back. Hey, Ryan, she said, falling into step beside me. A bunch of us are going hiking tomorrow. Want to join? I hesitated. I'd been keeping to myself outside of work still wary of forming new connections. But Sarah's smile was warm and genuine. You know what? That sounds great. I found myself saying the hike turned out to be just what I needed. As we climbed higher into the mountains, the fresh air and stunning views seemed to clear away the last lingering shadows of my old life. At the summit, as we sat catching our breath and passing around water bottles, Sarah nudged my shoulder. So mysterious. Ryan from Austin. What's your story? I tensed for a moment, then relaxed. These people had become more than just co-workers. Maybe it was time to open up a little. It's a long story, I warned. Sarah grinned. Well, it's a long way back down the mountain. We've got time. So I told them not every detail, but enough about Emily's betrayal. The viral video. The court case. As I spoke, I was surprised to find that the pain had dulled. It was more like recounting something that had happened to someone else. When I finished, there was a moment of silence. Then Sarah squeezed my arm. Damn, Ryan, that's rough. But you know what? You came out the other side. That's something to be proud of. The others murmured agreement, and I felt a warmth that had nothing to do with the sun overhead. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I belonged somewhere. After several months, life returned to normal. I had found an apartment with a view of the mountains. I joined a local rock climbing gym and even began dating again casually. Then one morning I got a letter with an Austin postmark. When I saw Jessica's name on the return address, my heart skipped a beat and my hands shook slightly. I opened it. Dear Ryan, 
I hope you're well. I've been wanting to write for a while, but I wanted to wait until I had some good news to share. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you again for everything you've done for me and my children. Your bravery in coming forward gave me the strength to advocate for myself. I can never repay you for that. I am writing to let you know that we are doing well. The kids and I relocated to a new town where no one knows our history. I started my own small bakery. It's not much, but it is mine, and for the first time in years, I truly feel free. Brad is still in prison. I've heard he's up for parole soon, but with the restraining order in place, I'm not concerned. We're safe and happy. Ryan, I hope you've found peace and happiness, too. You deserve it more than anybody I know. Thank you for everything, Jessica. As I finished reading, I realized I was smiling despite the pain and turmoil. Something good had emerged from this mess. Jessica and her children were safe and happy. And me? I was creating a new life one day at a time. I sat down at my desk and began writing a response. Dear Jessica, I can't express how pleased I was to receive your letter. As I wrote, I felt the last traces of my previous life slipping away. Bitterness, anger, and regret. Everything seemed to belong to a different person now. I looked out of my window at the mountains. Their peaks shone in the morning sun. My new life awaited, full of possibilities. For the first time in a long time, I felt ready to embrace them. Here is the next story. It was Sunday morning around 8 a.m., and I was tired as usual as I pulled onto our street after returning from California. Sheila's car was parked in front of our house, which surprised me. Despite the fact that Sheila was my wife and Lori's closest friend, I had negative feelings about her. Sheila was a bitch, to be honest. Lovely, but a bitch. And I was worried Lori would spend too much time with her. Sheila was divorced after being caught cheating on her husband, and she spent a lot of time in bars and clubs meeting new people. The kitchen was empty, so I went straight upstairs, where I was surprised to find my wife lying in bed with Sheila sitting next to her. Hello, baby, Lori spoke weakly. How was your trip? She appeared tired and pale. Are you all right, sweetie? I asked to come over and kiss her. Don't get too close, she said weakly, raising her hand to keep me away. I have a horrible flu or something. That's why Sheila is here. Sheila smiled at me, arching her back almost imperceptibly to reveal her large melons. I've always been curious. Was she acting naturally or was this a deliberate act? Hello. Todd Laurie became seriously ill, so I drove her here after we had spent some of the evening at Monroe's. She then developed a fever and vomited on several occasions. So I've decided to stay with her until you return. Thank you, Sheila. I appreciate it. Would you like some coffee? Breakfast or something? No, thanks. I had some coffee. Lori has just gotten off the phone with the doctor. He'll be able to see her in about half an hour, and I'll accompany her there. I began to protest that I would drive myself, but Lori insisted that Sheila could do it. You should get some sleep, baby. I know you have been awake for more than 24 hours. We agreed that I'd sleep in the guest room for a few days and not pick up anything from Lori. Ten minutes later, I saw Sheila supporting Lori as they walked to her car. To my surprise, Sheila drove toward Markham Avenue while my wife's doctor was in the opposite direction. I was too tired to give it much thought, so I dove into bed and fell asleep quickly. For the next week, I was a loving, caring husband from a distance, according to Lori. Dr. Simon said she probably had the flu. Nothing serious, but I should avoid close contact for about five days. So I called Lori's clothing store and informed them that she would be gone for a few days. I cooked meals for Lori and delivered them to her on a tray. I cleaned the kitchen. I did the laundry and spent evenings with my wife, watching TV from a chair in the bedroom while she lay in bed. However, we never got closer than ten feet. And by the weekend, I was even more horny than normal. We usually have sex at least twice per week. And after my trip to California, I had gone 12 days without any of her sweet lovemaking. By Friday, Lori was up and about, able to shower, dress, and do housework. That evening, I returned home with an armful of roses and was greeted with hugs and kisses from my vivacious wife. I didn't waste time in telling her what I wanted for dessert. To my horror, she lowered her eyes and said, I'm sorry, darling, but my period did not begin until this afternoon. Be patient for a couple of days, okay? I considered asking for a different level of intimacy, but I decided to be a saint and demonstrate my patience. We could at least touch each other. That weekend, we went to the movies, went for long walks, and spent every night snuggling in bed. 
By the following Tuesday, I realized that my luck might have changed. I finished work at 430 so that I could go home and surprise Lori with a delicious dinner. Instead, I received a few surprises myself. A few phone messages. First, she said, Hey babe, sorry for the short notice, but we need to do inventory tonight. A whole truckload of dresses arrived mislabeled. I'll probably stay here until nearly midnight. I apologize. Just have a sandwich and I will see you later. Could you also see if I had left my phone on the dresser? It is not in my purse, I am afraid. I am grateful. I cherish you. I thought, damn, my hopes of finding a little love were dashed. Dr. Mahoney initiated the second communication. Lori has a gynecologist. His secretary called to remind her of her stitch removal appointment for the next morning. What the hell? I considered calling Lori, but her cell phone was right in front of me on the kitchen table. I could have called the store number, but I assumed she was probably swamped with work at the time. Still, I planned to ask her about it as soon as she crossed the threshold. After a dinner of leftovers spiced with three or so beers, I watched some baseball before retiring to bed with the lights turned off. By 10 p.m., a short while later, I awoke to the sound of something sliding across the sheets, followed by the delightful sensation of a pair of warm lips encircling me, which belonged to Sheila rather than my wife. The light startled her, but it did not deter her from climbing on top of me. Sheila, what the hell are you doing? I screamed and pushed her away. I was extremely horny, but not enough to cheat on Lori by allowing her friend to jump on me. I've always wanted you, Todd, she said. I know Lori is working late and will never find out about this. Let it be just this once. Are you out of your mind? I am not going to be intimate with you, Sheila. Thank you, Todd. I am going to make you feel so good. She chased me across the room, wrapping her arms tightly around me. God knows I was tempted, but I had never and would never cheat on Lori. Loyalty was crucial to both of us. We discussed it before we got married, and I knew I could trust her just as much as she trusted me. I was angry and horny, which made things worse. I moved away from Sheila, grabbed her hand, and turned her away from me. Now get dressed, bitch, and get the hell out of here, Sheila protested, but I ignored her and pushed her into the bathroom, picking up her clothes and tossing them after her. If you don't get dressed within three minutes, I'll drag you out to your car and full side. After five minutes, I saw Sheila drive away in her car. I shuffled back upstairs to bed, shaking my head. I knew she was a bitch, hitting on her best friend's husband. How the hell did she get inside the house? I was about to fall asleep again when the light turned on and Lori yelled at me. You are the son of a witch! Damn you! How could you? Ouch! As I rolled over and jumped out of bed, her voice changed from furious to confused. Lori, what the hell is going on? Why are you yelling at me? Her face was bright red. She looked shocked and confused. I'm Todd, I apologize. I thought you were... She never finished the sentence. I waited and there was a long silence. Finally, I said, darling, is there anything I should know about? She sat back in her chair, struggling to look at me. Darling, it's a... I waited a little longer. It's... Well, some of the girls at work were saying crazy things and... And it occurred to me that maybe you were cheating on me. She looked at me timidly, just to see how I took it. Calmly, I said, That's the biggest load of crap I've ever heard, Lori. You know I would never do that to you. Why? Tonight, in our bed. I had no idea you'd be out late tonight until just today. What were your thoughts? That I was going to rush down to the nearest bar and pick someone up? Are you out of your mind? She shook her head and apologized repeatedly. But I was not buying it. Finally, I said, Okay, there's something going on here that you don't want me to know about. I will simply find another place to stay until you are willing to tell me the truth. While she cried and protested, I put on some clothes, pulled my suitcase from the closet, and began packing. I had no plans other than to find a motel for a few days, but there had been so many surprises lately that I didn't want to play dumb hubby any longer. Lori sobbed as I headed for the front door. Wait, Todd. Okay, I will do this. Tell me. I turned and said, that's it, Lori. Tell the whole truth or I'll leave. She gave a tearful nod. We walked into the kitchen and sat at the table. I assumed you'd be in bed tonight with a woman because she began crying again because of me. I invited Sheila to come and seduce you. Why would you do such a ridiculous thing, Lori? She could not look at me. I can't tell you, Todd. I, I did something terrible. And if I tell you, you will leave me. Please, please do not divorce me.
she sobbed. I believe it may be related to the stitches. Dr. Mahoney will take out tomorrow, I asked dryly. Lori stared at me in shock, then burst into tears that lasted more than ten minutes before she calmed down enough to speak again. It was all organized by Sheila, who, unsurprisingly, had been convincing Lori to relax, have some fun, and go out with her for months. In the evening, while on one of my business trips, Lori also went with her to Monroe's on Saturday, where they drank, danced, and ran into some of Sheila's close friends. Four of them had returned to Sheila's apartment by midnight, completely inebriated. Andy and Martin, Sheila's friends, joined the two girls. Sheila whispered to Lori that Martin was holding the largest instrument she'd ever seen, and he led my wife into an extra bedroom and apparently demonstrated it to her quite vigorously. And then he... She paused and spoke quietly. I was already furious and had no desire to dance around everything else. Is he a stupid bitch? She shrank back. He created me, you know. Then he wanted... Well, he made me take him, but he was too big and he tore me open. Sheila came in and saw what had happened, so she helped me clean up a little before taking me home. She stayed all night. The next morning, she took me to Dr. Mahoney, who gave me eight stitches and antibiotics before insisting on testing me for STDs. Thank God all of the tests came back negative. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the stupid cow I was married to, watching her cringe in agony. Is this it? I asked coldly. She nodded. It was terrible, Todd. It was the worst experience I've ever had. I'm very sorry. She looked at me pleadingly. It was only supposed to be a bit of dancing and flirting. I'm really not sure how it happened. I pounded my fist on the table, causing her to jump up. What happened was that you chose to try another man, I thought for a moment. And that is why you set Sheila up. I take it that if you catch me, you'll have a nice little get-out-of-jail-free card for yourself. She nodded but didn't look up. I sat there thinking and watching her cry. I'd never been so mad at that stupid girl in my life, and I was almost as mad at her so-called friend Sheila. I'm out of here, I said this while standing up. I am going to find another place to stay for a few days. No, baby, please, she yelled and followed me to the front door. I will never do it again. Never. I swear I learned my lesson. I'm sure you have, Lori, but whether you get the chance or never do it again is up to me. And before she could respond, I slammed the door behind me. That stupid bitch was all I could say to myself as I sat in my best Western hotel room, unable to sleep. Eight years of faithful marriage, and she lets her best friend persuade her to sleep with a stranger. My first stop in the morning was supposed to be at my lawyer's office to begin the divorce proceedings. It was pointless to waste time, so why did the thought of it make me so unhappy? I slept for almost three hours, so Sheila's flat was my first stop this morning. I knocked until she opened the door. Her eyes glazed over and she turned completely white at my sight, hissing at me. I pushed my way into her living room, closed the door behind me, and said, Okay, Sheila, let's have a little talk. Lori had been trying to reach me all day but I had ignored all of her calls and emails, so she was probably relieved to see my car in the driveway when she returned home from work. But she couldn't find me in the kitchen or the living room, so she hesitantly walked up the stairs, calling out Todd, Honey! As she entered our bedroom, Hello, Lori, I muttered, firmly thrusting into Sheila. We were having sex in the missionary position, and Sheila was pretty happy. Her moans and screams became increasingly louder. Oh, God! Lori exhaled and stared at us. We'll probably be done here in a few minutes. I spoke absentmindedly. You can wait downstairs or stay to watch. It is up to you, and with those words I returned my full attention to Sheila, sinking deeper into her. I rolled off of her, satisfied with exhaustion, and we lay side by side. Lori vanished, but reappeared a few minutes later, standing in the doorway, tears streaming down her face. Unfortunately, she said, I guess I can't say. How could you? Can I, Todd? No, Lori, you cannot. You and Sheila were planning to make me screw her to get you off the hook, and I thought it was the ideal solution to our problem, Sheila exclaimed. Lori, I thought you were a friend. I apologize, Sheila said, trying unsuccessfully to appear apologetic. But if I hadn't dragged you to Monroe, Todd wouldn't be about to divorce you. He made it clear that this was the only way he would ever forgive you. And I don't mind telling you. The last half hour was a sign that I'm going to have a good time in the coming weeks. Weeks? Lori staggered back, sinking heavily into her chair. What exactly are you talking about? 
It's simple, my dear faithful, Wi-Fi explained. You are moving into the guest room. You just had your stitches removed, and I know your ass will be off limits to me for at least a few weeks. I figure by the time you're ready to do this to me, I'll have figured out a lot of ways to make you happy. And then, and then we will be together. You and I, Todd? I nodded. As long as you don't pull another idiotic stunt like that, she flinched. I'm not sure what it's from. Never, Todd. I will never do that again. I have learned my lesson, believe me. Okay, then, I said, moving away from Sheila's lips and lifting her to all fours. Baby, I know I deserve this, but I don't truly deserve it. I mean, how can you even have another woman like that? I smiled as I spoke. Actually, Lori, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget how to do it. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leave a comment below with your thoughts on what happened. Take care.